This whole season is about Emmanuel. How many of you knows, knows what that means, Emmanuel? God with us. You realize how much we can celebrate that by coming in and, and, and passing out a card that says, Emmanuel, God with us, and how we can sing the songs that we just did, Emmanuel, God with us, and, and for the fact that we can read the verses in the New Testament in, in Matthew and Luke and say, praise God, Emmanuel, God is with us. But there was a period of time that God was not with them the way that we're talking about God being with us. He was not. And I think we are almost don't fully embrace and enjoy and, and love the fact that God is with us because we don't know what it's like for him not to be with us. Amen. We've never had a separation. We, we've, never, we've never had distance between us and God. And I, I, don't, I don't even think we fully understand what even causes the distance. What breaks the relationship, what hinders the fellowship, all those things. God gave us a huge visual in the Old Testament, and actually it was the Old Testament visual all, all the way from Exodus to, to Matthew was the visual of the, of the separation and the fact that God was not with us in the way that he's with us today. A, a way for me to illustrate it before we get into the, the verses is how many of you have ever had a long distance relationship before. You tried to have a long distance. How many of you would keep your hand up and say, it's hard? Okay, it, it is hard. So Jen and I met in college, and while we were in college, we had a very close relationship because we were with each other all the time. Classes, we'd have dinner together, we'd have chapel together, we had church together, we had all that. We went to Christian school, and I was there. And then, then at the end of the year, God worked in my heart, and God put it on my heart to move to ministry. My world was turned upside down. I know I've told you guys a story. I went to Jenny's dad, had it, had it in her, his mind that we were going to finish four years of college and then get married. I just finished my freshman year and going to him saying, I'm going to another school and I can't go without Jenny. And he said, well, I'll tell you what else you can't go with. He said, you, you, you can't go without money. Do you have money? I'm like, I have no money. And he was like, well, then how are you going to go with my daughter to Bible college and do this? I was, I don't know, but God's got a plan. And for some weird reason, he, he acknowledged it. He, he accepted it. He, he, he allowed me to marry his daughter. Well, there's an engagement period of a year that we had. Oh, there, there's a picture, a handsome devil with hair. Jenny with bangs, it was, it was, it was, it was a good time for us. That, that picture is dated 12 96 So that was really close to uh, the anniversary of this date right now. But 96 was one year before we got married. So this was, well, it was, this would have been about six months before we got married. Or, is that right? I'm, I'm really confused. Anyways, it was before we got married. <laughs> And so here we are, we're leading up to this, and Jenny's dad brought her back to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. You guys got to understand, I lived in Alabama, and we were both working a year to save up the money so I could go to Bible college, and I could take her with me. Here we're working all the time, and uh, we, we didn't have cell phones, so you actually had to wait till you got home to use the phone. And then you go in the house and your mom would be, you know, talking to me about wait till it's after six o'clock. You know why you had to wait till after six o'clock? Because the, dro the rates dropped. And back then there was something called a long distance phone call. Okay. And, and I know that's all foreign. And I laugh about it now about all those different things that we do, do with. I'd be waiting for six and then I'd call and, you know, and then I'd be worried because the time zone difference that I just get charged 32 cents instead of 11 cents. And anyways, it was complicated day and age. All right. And so I remember when we weren't talking to each other, the other form of communication, I know this is crazy. We would take paper and we'd take a pen and we'd write out words and we'd fold it up and we'd, we'd put it into an envelope and then we'd pay with a stamp and we'd send it through the mail and then four or five days later they'd get it. And, and by then everything had changed because we talked about everything that I said in the letter. But it was still a form of communication. But I tell you, it was a long distance relationship, but it was horrible. It wasn't the same. Well, I didn't mean it like that. Thinking, who is that person laughing like that? It's my wife. 
All I'm saying, baby, is <laughs> we, 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 we got married. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was no, no longer, I, I, I got to go home and share dinner with her, and we got to go to church together, and we got to serve together. And all of a sudden, I realized, but just like in Genesis, when God created Adam and God created Eve and God put Adam to sleep and he went and created Eve, he created Eve for Adam. And they were perfect together because God knows what he's doing when he creates your spouse for you. It's it's awesome thing. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't mess up. And God said, Adam, if, if I leave this up to you, you're going to mess all this up. So I'm going to knock you out. That's what God did. He literally put him to sleep. Because us guys are too dumb to do this by ourselves. And then he goes over and he forms Eve. And then he takes Eve literally and brings them to there. And, and God did that. And I'll tell you, from doing that, knowing that, God, I was complete with Jenny, knowing that God created Jenny for me. And I know I'm going to parallel this because of the fact that I, I've been saying from the very beginning, the whole point of this message is we were created for God. We were created to be with God. We were created for worship with God. And without that, you are incomplete. If you are complete with God, you are incomplete without God. And for anybody that's here that maybe you're new to church or whatever, I'll tell you there's a longing in your life for something that is missing that you'll never find in this world. You can't. Because it's only God that fills the void because you were created by God and for God. Amen. You guys know what happened. There was a separation. And I, 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 in order to understand this, of understanding of the, the love and the relationship, uh, a good illustration of this will be Morgan. You, you, well, I would do this with Jenny, but this works out good, the illustration uh, of a dad and a daughter. We are the children of God, all right? That, that we've got the relationship that we see in Scripture about us being brought together uh, one day with the bride of Christ. But we also have the illustration of us being children of God. There's something about having children that there's a bond and a love that's indescribable. There just is. It's, it's uh, kids used to gross me out. Is, is, am I allowed to say that? You know, they'd throw up in a restaurant and we'd be sitting there and I'm like, oh, you know, like... And then all of a sudden, when it's your kid and they're sick, you, you embrace them and you love them and you, you want them to be better. And it all, there, there's a bond there. You've got to understand how much of the bond, you gotta, thank you, <laughs> how much of the bond there is between parents and between a relationship like this of what it was meant to be. But at the same time of this relationship, this is what Satan hates more than anything. Because the fact that I am fulfilled and the fact that we have so much in common, the fact that, do you think we look alike? Everybody says we look alike. Do we look alike? All right, so, so you're right, she's beautiful. <laughs> That's what they're saying. <laughs> and the fact that we have this relationship and she was born in my image and the fact that God made us to be part of one another's lives, they're, 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 it's horrible outside of that. Pastor Dave, would you mind helping me for a minute? So in the story of creation, there was another person that showed up, and uh, <laughs> it's just an illustration, okay? Don't throw. And his goal was to break this up as much as possible to eliminate the fellowship that he had with God. Now, I, I told you guys about the idea of what God uh, does is he wants this fellowship. He, he doesn't share it. He, he doesn't want it with anybody else. But I'll tell you, with Satan, it's not even though about... <laughs> I'm sorry. Satan, sorry. Come back over here. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is my brother, by the way. So I, don't, I, I know most of you guys know that. So I, I can pick on him a little more. But in that relationship, Satan was more out to make the worship about anything other than God than it was more or less about himself. So I could sit there and say Satan wanted it about himself, and we illustrated that last week. But I'll tell you, Satan would like for you to worship a rock as opposed to God. He, he, he'd rather you be obsessed with a fictional character or whatever, anything to divert your attention, your love, and, and your intimacy away from God. And so when he slithered into this relationship and he caused this relationship to break, I, I want you guys to see, just, just, go be, just be evil by her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. 
I don't know how often we emphasize this, and I don't know, if Richard, if you have those verses in Genesis, but at the, at the break of this, because this was sin, and God is a righteous and holy God, do you understand that God cannot have fellowship with unrighteousness? And this is what's terribly difficult in the fact that in this relationship, even me being away from Morgan or Jordan or Logan or Jenny for any length of time, it's hard. And even talking to them from a distance or having a knowledge of them or reading about them is not the same thing as having a relationship with them. It's not the same thing. And all of a sudden, so he drove out man and he placed him east of the garden. He has this angel stand there separating them. The next verse, notice how it says this. It wasn't just that he drove them out of the garden, but he also separated them from the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil. There was a separation in that. So, so here's the visual. Can we visualize this throughout the rest of humanity of this, of the fact that God was pursuing man and God wanted the relationship more than anything. We throw out the verse all the time of John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is the Christmas story. That is the baby boom born in a manger. That's everything that we talk about. But just stop. Back up. God doesn't just love the world. And you say, why would God do everything of pursuing Moses and pursuing all that he did in the Old Testament and sending God in the flesh, Emmanuel, to die on a cross and be born in a manger? Why did he do that? For God so loved the world. There, there's, there's a lot of things that I love, but, but it's not an accident of how this verse is worded. God so loved us. And that blows my mind. Because all I'm really good at doing is messing up. And I am the polar opposite of God. Do any of you else feel that way? He is righteous and holy and good and faithful. He never deviates. He never messes up. He's never late. Never. I'm the opposite of all that. It just boggles our mind of the fact that God pursues me. And the Bible talks about that he gave his only begotten son. Let me word it like this. Because of this. He would do anything necessary to restore what was broken. He would do anything necessary to get back, which once was. I'm going to show you the end result that whosoever believed in him should not perish. He said, I'll fix this in such a way that it will never happen again. But have everlasting life. This visual right here. Is the entire Old Testament. God separated from man. And now you're going to sit there, Emmanuel. Man, we can't fully celebrate and embrace God and love him for Emmanuel unless we get the picture of where we came from. Amen. You've got to understand why it was such a big deal. You've got to understand why they rejected it so much because that visual of Jesus and a manger and a baby and, 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 and touching him and hugging him and being with him and eating with him did not make sense. Because they had all those years a long distance relationship because of sin getting in the way and problems in this life. We flipped it last week. It wasn't just Satan, but then there was Pharaoh. Pharaoh did the same thing. So God from a distance stands there wanting this relationship with man. And you know what the thing was? Pharaoh sits there and says to man, I'll make you a deal. And I, I hope I didn't go over a anybody's head and sitting there, what did that make? See, instead of him going and being there, Satan made a deal and said, I'll tell you what, why don't you stay right here and worship your God from Egypt? You know what that is like? Inviting God to come over here into this. God's never going to step into your sin to worship with you. Never. Because God is holy and righteous. He is good and faithful. We don't drag God into our sin. God calls us out of our sin into light, out of darkness into light. That's why I think so many Christians are so miserable in this world. Because they're longing so much to worship God and that they, they hear about it and they read about it, they know about it, but they don't experience it because it's a theory. Because we're not willing to let go of our sin of the world and the lust and the junk 
And all the crud that's around us all the time, we're sitting there. Second thing he said, I'll tell you what, you can go worship, but you have to worship with just the men, leave everybody else. God is not a God of division. God's not one that's going to separate us, separate our families, our kids, or our relationship, or whatever. That's what he did in the garden when he told Adam and Eve and started the argument there. Anything to divide the unity of what God has. And then he says, go ahead and worship, but you got to leave all your stuff here. We realize that every good thing that I have in my life came from God. And every good thing that I have in my life belongs to God. We don't worship on our terms. The whole thing is there's a battle for our worship. There is a separation. So you guys can be seated for just a minute. It's a big deal. Because we get to this part and in Exodus 6, 3, you don't have to turn there. And when God was explaining his intent, and I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but the name of Jehovah was I not known to them. So in this distance, and not, not that they need to be up here, but in this distance that's there, God was saying, they've never known me to be close and intimate. They've never known the Jehovah. And we explain that, the difference between Elohim of God and Jehovah that hands-on created us. I said, I hate that. I would never in all my life want for my kids to have a relationship with me where they know me as a provider. That all I do is send money to the house to pay the bills. I I, I never want to be one that they just call me up and say, hey, I need new pair of shoes and, and new jeans would be nice. Dad, Christmas is coming up and the newest toy out or the newest thing out right now is this. Can I have it? That That's all God was. He was distant. And God appeared unto Abraham and Isaac. And he said, I, 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 he said about them, he said, I don't want that. I tell you, if we live in the New Testament, we have a long distance relationship. You don't, you don't have worship with our God. So God had a plan. And later on in scripture, God was going to do something. God was going to bridge the gap. God had a plan plan to change everything. I I don't know a better way to do this, so please hang with me for the next three minutes and watch this. As the children of Israel left the life of slavery they had known for four centuries, God led them into the wilderness under the leadership of Moses. Here in the wilderness, the work of stripping away their identity as slaves began. A new culture was being fashioned, one that would reshape their identity and teach them in literal and symbolic ways that God was their only hope and their only source for life. The focal point for their physical camp, as well as the center of their worship, would be known as the tabernacle or tent of meeting. Moses was summoned upon Mount Sinai where God would speak to him for 40 days and nights, outlining the culture, giving the fundamental Ten Commandments, and explaining the ethics of this emerging culture he was creating in his chosen people. Upon Mount Sinai, God gave the blueprint for a portable dwelling place where his divine presence would be among the people as he led them forward toward the promised land, their permanent home. There would be an outer courtyard around the tent of meeting, and inside the tabernacle, there would be an outer chamber known as the holy place, and an inner chamber known as the most holy place, or holy of holies. Here in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant would dwell, and the very presence of God would descend and be among the people. The tabernacle would occupy the center of the multitude, a million or more strong, surrounded by the Levites, who were set aside to care for it and lead the people in the worship of Yahweh. The tabernacle accompanied the children of Israel through all their wanderings in the wilderness, as an ever-present reminder of who they were and who they were becoming. It crossed the Jordan River with them into the Promised Land, 
and eventually found a more permanent home in Shiloh, where the heart of the Israelite worship situated itself for the first three and a half centuries in their new homeland. The tabernacle was the religious heart of the people all the way through the time of the judges. As the time of the kings emerged, the Ark of the Covenant was lost in battle by King Saul, later to be regained but never again to be at Shiloh. Later, King David would bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and his son Solomon would build the first permanent replacement for the tabernacle, the Temple of God. This is so far beyond us. I mean, I, I can't even imagine having this God that would come in the, the form of a prophet or Abraham or Isaac and God would speak to them and then I would some way down the line hear it being given to me by another. But that's the way life was. But everything changed when God showed his power And in the showing of his power, he released them from the bondage and he brought them out of there to do what? To worship. And it wasn't a praise service and it wasn't singing. It wasn't all those. And I'm not saying that that wasn't part of it. But there was something that God was pursuing in the midst of that. It was so vital to what we have to experience today. You can imagine going to uh, Exodus 24 verse 1 when God first laid this out and you can imagine the children of Israel getting these instructions to build this and as they're doing it you can imagine them saying what in the world is this for? Six chapters going into extreme detail from everything from the gold plated this to what the signets would look like and, and the material and how it's woven and everything else was so above what they could imagine and then for them to say hey listen God's going to dwell in the midst of us and he's going to dwell here our God can come here and, and dwell with us I'm, and I'm sure they're trying to imagine what that looked like and what that felt like and all we've done is messed up and God's going to step into our world, but not in the way that we know through Jesus Christ and definitely not the way that we know through the Holy Spirit. Even to prove it, when he first gave the instructions, notice Exodus 24, verse 1, the opening verses of what he was even saying. And he, and he said unto Moses, come up unto the Lord. You say, what, what's the big deal about that? <laughs> come up to the one that wants to know you. And he said to Aram and Nabab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel, listen to this, and worship ye far off. I don't know about you, but that's not, that's not what I would want. And, and I bring it into the realm of my relationship. If, if God came to me and said, hey, Tony, I want a relationship with you, but I, I can't get close to you, that would break my heart. It would break my heart if I had a relationship with my daughter and I knew that the distance had to be there. And all I could ever do for the rest of my life is call her or message her or write her or know about her, but not ever have daddy dates and not ever have Christmas and not ever go on vacation it would not be okay. But this was temporary. I, I, I know I, I almost started doing this of laying out all the different pieces and walking through there. And then I thought, man, I've got 35, 40 minutes. not going to happen on Sunday morning. I'll do more confusion than good. But I, I do want to focus on one part. And that was there was a veil in the middle of that tabernacle. On one side of it was the Ark of the Covenant that represented God with them, and when they would go, they'd take the Ark of the Covenant, and they would all follow after that when they crossed in the Jordan. It went first. The priest would carry it. It was signified the presence of God. Inside of it, it had the broken Ten Commandments, the budded rod of Aaron, and, and, and pieces of the manna representing the failures of man. And on top of it was these angels in this covering, which represented the atonement that God covers our sin. And then God would shine down on top of that. Now, I know there's a lot of pictures and images that try to portray what that looks like. We don't know. All I know is the Shekinah glory or the shining of God or the presence of God would show up in a temporary holding place to be with them. On the other side of that, 
There was this outer court, and that's why I showed the video, just because I knew that there would be no way. And, and, and inside that court, they, they had the altar, and they had uh, the basin to clean their hands, and then they would be invited to come inside this tabernacle, and inside that tabernacle was the table of showbread, and they would have that, the, 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 the unleavened bread, and they would have the, the presence of God that would sit there and dwell through the lighting of it, the menorah, the light. It wasn't the same. Exodus 25, verse 1, And the Lord God spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring unto me an offering. And every man that giveth it willingly, with his heart, he shall take my offering. And with this offering, which he shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. And he goes on to explain the building of all this. Everything you're about to see is God inviting us, not God making us. They came out of slavery. God wasn't putting them back into slavery. God's never going to make you worship him. God's never going to make you have to go to him. He said if they want to, they could could bring this to me and I'll take it and I'll use it to build it up and have a place for us to meet and have a place for us to worship from their hearts. But through all this, I want you to see the pursuit of God. Let, let, let me walk you through this pursuit just to lay the ground week work for what we're going to do next week. I, I want you to get this. But what we explain through this explains the Christmas story. And I think so much of it is we start with the manger and we start with the angels and we start with the shepherds that we forget about why of what was going on, what, what led to this. We learn what worship is. Number one, that the pursuit of God, God pursues to be with us. Look at verse 8, Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now for us, man, we sit there and we'll say on Sunday, let's go worship God. And in our car, Lord, I meet with you this morning and I pray. Or before you go to bed and whatever, you pray, pray, pray. They didn't have that in the way that we have that. As you can imagine... As God says, make them a sanctuary, a holy place, a place set aside for me. In the middle of all the children of Israel, this place was in the middle. It was the hub and all of them be around. And and God said, I want to be the focal point. I want to be the center. I I, I want to be the source. I want to be the core. However you want to word it, God wants to be smack in the middle of it. One thing that we have to understand when Jesus came into the world and the world rejected him and we get so upset that there was no room in the end and they rejected him as king and they hung him on the cross and they rejected him. Sometimes I'm going to tell you we do the same thing. I don't know we don't even want to think about it from that perspective but I'll tell you the whole thing that God was trying to say is I don't just want to be part of your life where you visit me on a day of the week that you call the worship service. I want to be in the center of your life every day in every way of your life. God literally saying, listen to the next verse, according that I will show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, the place of the dwelling place of God. Dwelling place literally mean I want to take up residence. As I, I, I'll tell you, to stand up and sing worship songs, if God isn't, has not taken up residence in your life, then you don't know worship. Sometimes we live the way that we want all the time and God is nowhere found in our lives until we show up on that day of worship and it was never intended to be that way. God pursued with them. You know, it's neat. The Shekinah glory would meet inside of there and outside of there, there would be a pillar in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. No matter what, God was always before them leading them. They were never to be by themselves. God was desiring to be present with them. In Leviticus 26, 11, you don't have to turn there. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. You realize, you say, wow, that, that really wasn't what we have. But I'll tell you, that, that's as close as they could get in that aspect of this. When they went to war, God was there. When they were scared, God was there. When, when they were stuck in a situation, whether the Red Sea or the Jordan, God was there. Let me ask you this morning, making application of this, where is God in your life? If you showed up to this worship service today to worship with God, and I, and I, and I know what we mean, but I'll tell you, we've got to be really careful with how we put this. I am going to church 
to meet with God. I would tell everybody, I hope you did come to church to meet with God. But I sure hope you were meeting with him long before you got here. Amen. And I think that's why somehow in the Old Testament they had to pursue a place rather than having the dwelling in the presence of God. And, and I knew I was going to do this. I'm going to get ahead of myself and start talking about next week of what it was. But God desired, no, not God didn't just desire, God pursued to be smack in the middle of everything, of every trial, of every problem of their life. Morgan, you got a minute. Come up here with me. There was a second part of this. God was not just pursuing this, this curtain, this veil. This was the relationship. Inside the tabernacle, there was the side of it that dwelled the Holy of Holies, which was the presence of God. Now, you, you can think about this from our perspective and, and, and I know I'm reversing this because I, I, I'm, let, let me play Morgan for a minute, okay, and without confusing you. But for us as Christians wanting to get the other side, they would go in and they would have to sacrifice the animal. And they'd have to clean their hands and they'd have to go and eat the, the bread and they'd have to burn the incense, which represents the prayers and all this. But I'll tell you, this was the relationship. This was it. I, I'm glad this in this illustration is black versus what it was in Scripture of the different colors. But it's just a matter of you have to understand that there is sin that separates us from having intimate fellowship with God. Every, every one of us in our lives, we so desperately want it, understanding that, that sin is significant and the fact that it hurts our relationship with God and Israel sinned over and over again and God desired to be with them. But this is what it looked like. There was a separation. There was not a connection. There was a distance. And God was not okay with this. The same way that I would not be okay with this if this was me and Morgan in our relationship. I'm not okay with the fact that I'm invited into her presence, but I can't have a connection with her. Now, can any of you flash forward in your minds and know the Lamb of God came to take away the sins of the world and he died on the cross and on the cross. When he cried out, it is finished, what happened? All of a sudden, God reached down from heaven and ripped this in half and restored the fellowship with us. And I know I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I, if we don't understand the fact that God desired this. Now you got to think, when God invited them into his presence and, and reversing the situation here for a minute though, but think about how this was and what was in there. A table of showbread where they would go in and they would eat in the presence of God. That fellowship with God, it represented everything, represented something. But in the course of that, God said, listen, come as close as you can and stop. The table of incense represented a whole lot more than just burning incense. It represented the fact that they would burn these and in Isaiah 56, 7, and other verses from my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. They would burn it in Revelation, we read, and I, I won't get into all that for the sake of time, about how our, our prayers are the incense of God and the fact that God desired for us to get into his presence, not only to fellowship with him, but to talk with him. How in the world did we get to the point where our worship with God is nothing more than a song rather than a conversation with God? Can I stop for a minute? Me, me and Morgan are, are pretty close, and I know I'm going to hear this from the boys after the service is over. It's all about Morgan. <sighs> They're not as cute, so this worked better. <laughs> I love the fact that she relies on me for so many things. She never has to worry about going hungry. She doesn't have to worry. I'm going to go out of my way to make sure all those things are done. But I tell you, on the re receiving end of that is her father. I want to know that I'm way more than just a request line for stuff. Amen. And you think about this. The Bible says, let your request be made known unto God. The Bible says to call unto him if, if, if you have need and, and to cast your yoke upon him or your care upon him and to take your yoke uh, with God and, and walk through life and all those other illustrations of this. But have you ever realized that the fellowship that God desires for us is more than just requesting for things? It's the fact that God brought them into his presence to burn the incense day and night. 
because God wanted to hear from them. God wants to hear from you. God wants, it, it's a big deal for me to hear what's going on in her life and what she's doing and what she's afraid of and what she likes and what she doesn't like. You've got to realize that in the New Testament, when God was so separated from this aspect of the relationship, and all of a sudden, God came to us, and they're kissing and holding a baby. What was the pursuit of God? Was to have a relationship, and he was raising a family, and A with them, and went out and sat with sinners. And at the end of his life, he sat down with them at the Last Supper, and he ate with them. God pursued a relationship with them. We're going to step back. It still looked like this. There was still the separation. All of our lives, I hope, as we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he did and how he worked and everything, never get this out of your mind. But the last pursuit that I could tell you, there, there was the pursuit to be in our lives. There was pursuit to have fellowship and that connection with us in our life. But let me wrap things up with this. There was a pursuit to restore. At the beginning of time, there was this relationship with us and God. And they sinned. God covered their sin temporarily by taking this sacrifice and the animal skin and he covered man, but it was only temporary. It was only temporary. But then we wrap things around and we get further into, into time when God actually started having them make this, the sacrifices of the animal. And you can imagine on this side, of, we're going to reverse roles. Okay, you're going to play God for a minute. I'm going to play the one pursuing <laughs> They would come into the presence of this and they would come into this courtyard facing two items, the brazen altar. Before they could ever come to God, they had to come to this altar and they had to take an animal that did nothing wrong, a lamb. They had to lay it down and that priest had to sit there and take the life of that lamb. And say, how brutal, how gross, how disgusting You know what's amazing about that? It's how this can be so perfect and holy and righteous and close and everything and how this can be so brutal and nasty and gross. They take the life of the animal. You've ever seen the videos of all that stuff, just blood everywhere and it'd sink down and they'd burn it with fire and then they'd go over to that basin, they'd wash their hands before they could even be invited into the presence of that place. But can I tell you all of that was nothing more than a visual and reminder that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every bit of that, because I'll tell you what, they walk through and they'd kill the animal and they'd do that, they'd be full of blood and they'd wash their hands and they'd walk into that place and they'd have the prayers and the light and the table of showbread and they would do all that and this didn't change. Once a year they would go in and sprinkle blood on the altar, but outside of that, and the next day would go, it would go in and they would do it, do it, do it, do it, everything. God was reminding, nothing that you'll ever do will ever fix the problem you have. You understand, every one of us have to get that. The wages of our sin is death, and that wages of our sin is separation from God. And there's nothing, nothing that you'll ever do for the rest of your life that will change that. That veil stayed there until one thing happened. That one thing was the Lamb of God was born in a manger. It wasn't an accident. Let me tell you, it wasn't an accident. That there was no room in the inn. It's no accident that he was born in a stall. There was no accident that he was called out to a bunch of shepherds that were raising sacrifices. It's no accident that sinners were invited into his presence. It was no accident that he raised perfect To one day be the sacrifice, to one day be the the lamb that was slain, to one day eliminate what was separated. And that was Christmas. 